Um, so thanks everybody again for joining our working group progress meeting today. Um, we're gonna hear some updates from all the working groups. Um, so uh, if everyone can kind of within maybe five minutes to share briefly um, some of the things you all have been working on um, and then maybe making some progress towards um, goals for GCC 2023. Um, also, we'd love to hear about um, blockers and other things that are coming up, um, ways that we can help um, move those activities along. Um, so before we get into that, um, uh, I guess uh, maybe Anton, uh, would you be interested in covering some of the roadmap review? Uh, if not, maybe we can do that. Uh, I think, uh, uh, well, the roadmap is not a secret document, it's, it's, a, it's a known document. So what I would do is I would actually, I think, so the PI's plan with this uh, will be to listen to the working groups, and then we go back and next week we see uh, what we need to add to the roadmap, and then we'll discuss this with working groups again. So in the interest of time, I think we should just start with working groups. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, all right, so let's kick it off with the UI UX working group. Uh, okay. Next, okay. Um, all right, so the way I broke this up, I didn't know exactly how we wanted to do it, but basically I tried to put stuff in two milestones, 23.1 and 23.2 being G the GCC release. Um, what we had, like our mandate, I guess, from the, the two-year roadmap was, uh, is up at the top right. It's, you know, usability fixes that can be done quickly. Uh, obviously, getting the new history in was the big push for the, the last uh, discussion like this. Um, and then planning ahead to the hierarchical view were the sort of the three big things that we, we had on the roadmap. Um, so with that in context, I'll jump in. Um, for 23.1, um, we'll have a brand new workflow editor. Um, this is in conjunction with the workflows group. So I've tried to like note when it's a collaborative effort to, to the right here. Um, we want to have this, it's gonna be a, uh, it will be able to render a static view of a workflow and we wanna publish it as a separate package. So for example, you could import it in the hub and show a rendering of the workflow in right in the Galaxy Hub, that kind of thing. Um, so that'll be ready for 23.1. Um, we wanna, so the, the graph view, and we'll talk about this more in the context of 23.2, um, the graph view and VS Code, Mary says, <laughs> that's right. Uh, the graph view um, is a massive project. Um, and as with a lot of things in the UI, it, it turns out that like the rendering of a graph is pretty easy. Um, it's getting the right data to the client at the right time that's hard. Um, so this is, uh, per, per the 23.2 note here, um, really kind of more of a back-end project, but um, as an exploration or precursor to this, we're working on uh, the tool input out, the job input output display, um, showing data sets that are related to a particular data set uh, in a better way in the, in the history. Um, that'll be in 23.1. Um, the whole toolbox search and modernization, there was a bunch of progress on this that got backported to the previous release in fixing tool search. Um, but building on that, uh, we want to have super fast filtering of the toolbox in the left panel, client side only. So like as you type, it filters in real time and you see immediately what tools match and what tools don't. But then we have an advanced results panel that pops out that does the full depth uh, searching the tool help and all that stuff with rich results in the middle panel. Um, so that that should be merged pretty soon and, and available. Um, there's a brand new multi-history that's already merged. Um, it builds on the the new history. Um, so it uses, instead of the new history, the instead of the old history, the new history does the same multi-panel thing. You can pick, uh, you can pin particular histories that you're interested in, and those are preserved. So when you go back to the multi-view, you see the things that you care about. Um, obviously, you can unpin them too. 
Um, so that's that's going to be real nice for users. Drag and drop works really cleanly in it. It's very nice. Um, and swapping that view over enabled us to delete the entire old history. So that's great. Um, lots of legacy code gone there. Um, there's now a unified export UI. This was sort of prototyped in a couple of different ways with the biocompute stuff and the RO crate, but now it's like one coherent framework where we can plug in more export things and just, it's much more, it's, it's well encapsulated now, right? So the logic for exporting artifacts from Galaxy is, is coherent there. Um, so that's, that'll be in 23.1. Um, there's a lot of work towards general modernization. Um, we shifted to view 2.7. I think about this kind of a, a lot like Python 2.7, where it lingered around for a long time just because of library issues and things like that. But th it's really kind of the same thing. Um, we're pretty happy on 2.7 because we can use the composition API and a lot of the nice things from 3, but we're not forced to abandon um, particularly heavyweight dependencies like bootstrap view and things like that right away. Um, so that'll that'll keep going. Um, we'll have Pina in, and there's already a lot of composition API stuff in, in the code base uh, that'll be in 23.1. Uh, and we're hoping to have just actual straight up TypeScript. We can we can currently write util utility code in TypeScript. There's a little bit of a, a hitch with trying to kick into view components writing TypeScript. It's, Webpack's not wanting to compile them right, but we're, we're working on it. Um, but we'll have a much more modernized code base uh, moving forward with types. Um, so client navigation will be dramatically improved. Um, we've eliminated a lot of the entry points. It's a single page app for the most part now. Uh, there are a few reloads. Um, some of those are per for performance reasons. Um, and some, it just makes sense to have a, a couple of entry points depending on what you're doing. Um, but it's kind of a single view tree now, which is nice. Uh, we've worked on accessibility a ton. Um, when we, when I, I first checked a couple of months ago, the, there were, you know, loading up a basic history, there were a hundred or 150 random, you know, uh, violations. And now we're down to zero on the initial page load. Um, we need to, or at least we were a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we need to expand that within the application, make sure everything's compliant. Um, we also probably need to pick what compliance uh, standard we're going to stick with, whether it's AA or AAA. There are a couple of nuances there, but um, but yeah, tons of progress is made on that, and it'll be available in 23.1. Um, for the storage dashboard, we want new visualizations, D3-based stuff to actually see where all of your stuff is. Um, this might be tree maps, probably start as a simple pie chart or something like that. You can click through and actually see what's consuming your your, your history uh, or your storage space. Um, we'll have a new tabular renderer. Uh, it's a proto it's going to be a prototype for uh, visualization based. So the idea is in 23.2, visualizations will be sort of first class, right? When you click the eye on a data set, you won't get a, a response from the web server that says, this is how this thing is displayed and you just get it. What you'll get is an interface that queries a display API that says, okay, these are the different ways we can look at this thing. Here's 10 different visualizations that are suitable, right? Um, so the new tabular render, uh, a tabular visual, tabular display of data set is effectively a visualization, right? It's just the simplest possible one. Um, so we're gonna use that as the prototype for this first class visualizations thing. Um, and that, but the tabular bit itself will be in 23.1. Um, we'll finally address the remaining IT display issues. So, so a lot of those are pending on the, the new history. Now that that's in, we can follow up and have uh, a, a nice IT representation in the history with an accurate uh, status. Um, that actually, when you look at like my running visualizations, we can, up, we're going to update that too, where it actually pulls and, and things like that. There's, there's, a, there's a nice issue with a bunch of bugs there that'll all be fixed in 23.1. Uh, and then finally, for 23.1, we want a pre-built pre -built client for, uh, for production releases, just the mainline stuff. So we'll publish it on NPM. It'll automatically fetch, install. Uh, it, the, the, the linchpin here has always been the visualizations, how we actually want to handle those. So all this ties together. Um, for 23.1, this will only be the, the main web client. We, we're not going to worry about the having a full client and visualizations thing 
shipped with with uh with your uh with your galaxy but eventually um so for 23.2 uh we'll we'll obviously this depends a lot on the back end like i mentioned we'll have a graph view of history um so what we thought was a nice first step towards this um or second step i guess since the input output thing is first step is to reuse the the new workflow editor as a way to look at a single invocation in a graph view right so we'll be able to see given a, a workflow invocation scroll around you look at it it looks like a regular workflow in the editor but you can click on things and see the state of of different steps and and that kind of thing um so that'll be in 23.2 um notification framework we had uh an outreach project over the summer uh, to build out a notification framework, which is something that's been requested uh, for for years, um, you. Sorry, chat distracted me. Um, so we so we're going to pick pick that up and have it finished off for twenty three two. Um, the a big thing that users really won't see for the most part, but it's something that's really going to help us. Uh, it's going to make it a lot easier for us to carry less baggage. Um, is that view is going to be the sole framework in the primary app. There won't be any more booth, any more um, um, backbone, no more jQuery and uh, minimal entry points. So it might make sense to have a couple of entry points, depending on what you're doing. Um, but backbone and jQuery have, have completely got to go. Um, the main things uh, outstanding for that are uh, our grids, the upload component and form elements. Um, but work's being done on those and, and I expect it'll be done by 23.2. So for GCC, um, the first class visualizations thing that I talked about, um, I, I won't reiterate it. Uh, so that'll, that'll take a display API from the backend group, which, uh, like I'll talk about is probably UI UX folks with two hats on. Um, uh, but it's, it, it, I don't know how to assign that. Um, and then, uh, so We've talked about this before, but um, Trackster has been sort of maintenance mode only. Uh, for 23.2, we're going to have, uh, with the accompanying the new first class visualizations, IGV.js replacing Trackster is sort of the default click and browse a genome, right? Or browse a file. Um, so the auto generated uh, TypeScript client for the Galaxy API, we should have for 23.2. Uh, this is a conjunction with the back end. It really, there's almost nothing to do on the UI for this to actually get it done. It's mostly just consuming the back end in a structured way, um, building on all the work from, from the Swagger uh, uh, schema. Um, but basically, we can automatically generate, Mary showed this off in a really cool demo at GCC, but we can automatically generate uh, TypeScript bindings for the entire Galaxy model because it's annotated well, right? And then in the client, we use that instead of trying to use Axios and talk to the API directly and you know, all this stuff. So that, that'll be really nice. And it'll be published as a separate package on NPM as like, it's, it's kind of like um, the BioBlend objects, but the JavaScript version, that's kind of what it is. Um, so it, that'll be really nice and it'll enable us to, to improve testing and all kinds of stuff. I'm sorry, I've gone way over five minutes. Um, so another big project is uh, the archival or frozen histories. Um, again, this is mostly back end. There's going to be some front end to it. And it's, again, kind of the same people working on it on both sides of the fence. Um, but we want to have support for that. And then uh, formal testing for accessibility. Um, so I mentioned we're, we want to be compliant for 23.1. But what we really need is, uh, and we have a strategy laid out to do this, uh, to, to continue ensuring that the app is compliant is to have a real testing for uh, using X in a, um, <clears throat> like in, in a, so what we want to do is run through the tours and at each step uh, analyze the page and see what's going on and say, okay, this thing is compliant. It's not compliant. This, this needs labels. This doesn't. Uh, and we'll have automated testing for all the accessibility stuff. Um, we already have the linting, but the E2E end-to-end -end stuff is, is what we still need to do. Um, so yeah, challenges. Uh, I guess I'll start with the second one first. It's one thing that's gonna be challenging this time is last, last time around our mandate was basically history, 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 history. So everyone was looking at the same thing and pushing on the same thing. Um, 
as you can see, there's a ton of stuff on this slide. So one challenge is just going to be trying to organize and keep track of stuff and make sure it all gets done. Um, and the other challenge is there's kind of a backend shift to uh, compensate for all the time we spent on the UI, but this isn't really a bad thing. As you see, like most of the stuff on, or a lot of the stuff on here has a significant backend component. So I don't think, I don't know. I was kind of digging for challenges to put on here since you asked for them, but um, that may or may not actually be a challenge. Uh, one question, uh, yep. your list, uh, for example, 231, is that in some priority sorting order or is No, uh, yeah. it's some of it, uh, it's kind of priority uh, and a lot of it's actually already done because 23 one is going to be a big release. Um, so, I, uh, if, I mean, you, if you want, I can go back and annotate like what's done, what's remaining to do, that kind of thing. Yeah, we can talk about this at the UI meeting. I just yep. want to bump IT display issues higher. That's, That's definitely going to be in. Yes. I guess I had, a, I had a variant of the same question, which is, I mean, this is awesome, <laughs> right? There's so much going on. I guess I'm, uh, I guess like you said, you know, because there's so much going on, you've, you know, and it's not hyper-focused around one activity. What's the strategy for um, just <coughs> keeping organized and, and, keeping good progress. I mean, it could be, you know, maybe have a prioritized list with stretch goals, or maybe there's some other strategy you had in mind. Uh, I mean, the thing that has helped the UI group the most, I, I think in, in recent times is having our weekly meeting. We completely shifted the cadence from having a meeting once every one, two, three, or never months uh, to, you know, meeting every single week, yeah. making sure stuff's progressing. Um, and just sort of staying on top of it. Um, I've experimented with like the project boards and things like that, but basically, I mean, my, my, I don't know. I think about the project boards as a great way to get your thoughts organized about something and then nobody ever does anything with it and you throw it away. It's not a wasted, it's not a waste of time to do that. But for me, it doesn't seem to be a great mechanism for like actually keeping track of stuff. Um, maybe we can get better at that. I don't know. Um, but I think our, our, our new meeting cadence, uh, combined with the, uh, everyone's really been great. Um, I'm super happy with the UI UX group. Um, I don't think we'll have a, a whole lot of trouble actually hitting all these goals. Wow. That's awesome. Well, I, I, we should move on just for time, but, um, I'd be interested to kind of get a preview of all these, uh, features at some point. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, next up is testing and hardening. All right, testing and hardening. It's uh, me and John. So our group is slightly different from uh, backend and UI UX. So we don't have a long list of items we check off. As a result, I organized, we organized our report slightly differently. Uh, to us, that made more sense. So first of all, completed since last report, uh, release testing 2205. We covered a lot of territory, including we covered all the key features for 2205, thanks to a really, really great release testing team. So thanks for that. Uh, second, Writing automated tests for Galaxy. This is our new tutorial covering for now only unit tests and API tests. It's still approximately at three to four hours long. We tested it uh, at GCC at training. It went very well. Uh, we didn't have a pack a packed room, but uh, the, atten the attendees who were in the room they uh, they stayed for the duration and they seemed to have enjoyed it. Uh, new tests and uh, testing infrastructure. This is ongoing work. This is very similar for any reporting period. So only some highlights. Um, there have been, and again, these highlights don't mean to be exhaustive. There is a lot more. Uh, there were ex extensive tests for the new database migrations CLI system. Uh, there were a ton of tests as part of tool shed refactoring. Uh, and also there was a lot of great work modernizing the testing code done by Nicola, who is not even a member of our group. So we are not taking credit, but we had to mention this. And I'm sure I'm missing a lot of other work which uh, took place during this period. So for GCC uh, 2023, uh, First, uh, the testing tutorial, uh, again, it covers only unit tests and API tests for now. Uh, it covers them in depth. We 
probably need to add uh, the other main tests. At least we need to add sections on end-to-end uh, -end and integration and client test and of the client testing. Uh, this will definitely push it into six to eight to nine hour territory. So when we use it at GCC, we will simply pick and choose uh, depending on maybe audience preferences. But uh, again, that, uh, that tutorial needs to be in GTN so that individual contributors can use it for writing tests or learning how to write tests. Uh, ongoing work on testing infrastructure. So, uh, and I'll talk a little more about it in the interactions with other working groups, but uh, the specifics will be based on other groups needs. Um, backend specifically UI UX systems, most likely, uh, as well as our own work on primarily backend projects, because we are uh, all of us are uh, members of the backend group, and that's where our mostly primary focus lies. Uh, so the anticipated focus for now, and again, that may change based on the priorities of major projects carried out by other groups, but for now, it's going to be uh, testing infrastructure for revamping the or overhauling the tool shed. Uh, second, it's going to be uh, a lot of work for the data access layer, and that is all things model, database, SQL alchemy, uh, and also end-to-end -end tests. And again, anything else to support uh, focus projects by other groups. Uh, release testing 23.1, 23.2, since both of this happens before GCC 2023. Uh, so our plan is to freeze early, uh, to start at the freeze, and that will uh, leave us three to four weeks for addressing any issues raised uh, by the release testing before the release is announced. So we plan to be better at uh, reporting in time so that stuff gets fixed before it's announced. Um, we will try to explore ways to reduce manual testing where automation is possible. Again, this has been um, an ongoing concern since the very first time we did formal release testing. Uh, there is not the, we don't have the right amount of manual testing. We do too much. We do too much repetitive things, which can be automated. We just never have never had the bandwidth for this so we always put it off until the next time and as a result people get bogged down in boring work so we will try to start working on it this time so 23 one hopefully we'll have at least some result on improving this uh the second thing is we will try to run some form of load testing in parallel with release testing uh, we haven't done it yet, uh, so we are trying not to be ambitious, but again, we are trying to <coughs> switch from having discussed it every single time we plan release, release testing to having done something, and then we can improve. So hopefully we can start with 23.1 and then improve it in 23.2. Uh, interactions with other groups. Uh, so we've had uh, in-depth discussions as a, as a, as a team uh, on whether to expand the group and how to expand the group and decided not to, uh, or rather we decided not to make that a primary focus. So as a disclaimer, of course, everyone is welcome and we, we, we are happy to welcome new members. Uh, and actually we now have larger meetings. It used to be just the three of us, me, Marius, and John, uh, now we have more and uh, this is great. And this actually helps us a lot as a team. So everyone who attends the meetings, thank you. Um, but many of our, whenever we come up with a long list of to-do items, many of these items require complex writing complex tests. And often those complex tests require modifying our testing infrastructure or developing new testing infrastructure. So essentially, uh, no matter how horrible it sounds, we're not newbie friendly by design. Uh, so instead we decided that the better way, the more optimal way to serve the community would be to focus on reaching out to other working groups and providing a test engineering service. So we help with writing tests, we uh, especially writing complex tests and and uh, again, focusing on providing sufficient testing infrastructure to meet other groups' needs. Um, of course, we also encourage individual contributors to use Galaxy's testing utilities. And uh, our, also another important focus is to develop, keep developing more helpful documentation on working with the Galaxy's testing infrastructure and uh, documentation on how to write tests, how to use Galaxy's abstractions and many test utilities. 
Um, and also in addition to that, we will be developing guidelines for utilizing the testing infrastructure on uh, Galaxy's automated tests on uh, running in instances, uh, both, both, both production and test. Uh, finally, uh, the long term, not scheduled, but constantly uh, discussed is um, more structured performance testing, which would include load and scalability, stress, fault to tolerance, etc. essentially to, to test things like speed, capacity, scalability, stability, security. Uh, we have discussions on this. We plan to address it eventually. We don't have the bandwidth yet, but this is uh, in the plans. John, did I miss something? I think I didn't. So that's us. Awesome. Uh, no, it sounds good to me. Thanks so much for presenting that. Oh, and thank you for the link. Yes, uh, the work by uh, Australians. So thanks for that, John. I mean, it sounds like things are going well. I'm, I'm excited that other working groups are stepping up to kind of um, you know contribute or get advice from you all. Are there are there other places where you need uh, help or attention or or where you see that there could be some pitfalls ahead? I think not until we have really started implementing any serious work on different types of performance testing. Once we get into that territory, we'll need all the help we can get, uh, most likely from well systems back and then UI. Uh, perhaps ignorant question. So you talked about the uh, two shed uh, uh, refactoring. Uh, there must be some issues or uh, you know plan for that. Can you send a few links, John? Uh, yeah, I will. Um, yeah, I, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you offline, Anton. Sounds good. Thanks so much, John. We'll move on to the workflows working group next. Oh, Mario, you're muted. Uh, yeah, it's been quite a productive uh, period. Um, so especially, um, I presented some of the IWC work on the European Galaxy days. And following that was a hackathon that was extremely productive. And out of that hackathon and some more work last week and this week, uh, we merged workflows for ChipSeq, AttackSeq, Cut and Run, RNA-Seq. So that's something we really wanted to do because I think they're really core workflows in, in uh, maybe the the original audience of Galaxy, let's, let's call it that way. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, that was really, really cool. Um, uh, also huge thanks to Lucille. Um, these were her workflows. She was already using them in production. Um, and what we did there was prepare them for uh, IWC standards, which means um, adding in all the annotation, uh, replacing some of the you know, complicated awk steps with some expression tools. We created a new expression tool to um, make it easy to have nice, clean workflow input logic. Um, yeah, since the last time, we've obviously been doing updates and fixes to the existing workflows, and we're now at uh, 22 workflows in total. Um, we also discovered uh, that there were some issues with using reference data via CVMFS on the CI um, instance. So that's working now as well. And all of these workflows, new workflows are actually using this. Um, yeah, I already mentioned we have a new expression tool that maps uh, any sort of value to any sort of other value. So if you, if a step produced an output, um, that's maybe, the string false, you can turn that into a Boolean false and connect that to the next step. Um, and yeah, I mean, these expression tools are are nice. They're regular kind of Galaxy tools, but instead of a command line, they have a JavaScript section that defines the output parameter. Um, this tool I'm talking about is kind of 
just a dictionary implementation in a sense, but it's kind of complicated to write as a Galaxy tool. Um, I, I will come back to that, but we need to improve on that. Um, David has created a VS Code extension for uh, Galaxy workflows. So this is really, really cool. It's available on the marketplace. It works with your local VS Code, or it works with the GitHub editor that you get when you just press dot on a GitHub repository. Um, really cool. Um, and uh, there is an improved workflow import page. Ali Reza did that. Um, that will make importing workflows much more streamlined in the interface. There are fewer clicks to be done. Uh, so that's great. Uh, the next slide. Yes. Um, yeah, so for GCC 2023, um, we want step input JavaScript expressions. So these expression tools I was talking about, um, we have a couple of standard ones, like the one that takes a value from a file and turns it into a parameter of any type, another one that is basically a dictionary implementation, um, and one that lets you combine different parameters into one. Uh, but it's kind of verbose, and it would be great if we had a text field where you can just enter that expression, and then an uh, editor implementation um, that guides the user towards the available. Oh, there's some feedback here. That would guide the user towards the available um, uh, variables that are available in in the job itself. Um, Similarly, I think we really need conditionals. Uh, the workflows we've added now made that really clear. Uh, we have points, I mean, with conditionals, you can include, for instance, optional QC steps um, that you may not want to run all the time, but that kind of belong into the workflow. Or um, if you have parameters that need wildly, or steps that need wildly different parameter yeah. settings based on whether you're dealing, for instance, with single end or paired end reads, um conditionals would be extremely helpful uh there and i think we can probably get this on the api level in in 23.1 and then target the editor in 23.2 um yeah i mean dan already mentioned uh we're rewriting the uh workflow editor um uh, with the goal of taking it and using the display component for other purposes um, so one would be to embed it in, in VS Code. So those people that like to write uh, their workflows manually, and um, you can do that then in VS Code or see your changes or possibly produce a visual diff of the workflow since the, the last version it will be super useful for a static page. And it would become very, very useful if the toolshed can um, augment the information in the workflow with the tools, because uh, the Galaxy worker language does not include the tools, it just has references to the tools and the states or the settings of the tool itself are in there, but without any context. Uh, so instead of dealing just with a JSON blob, you could actually see the um, yeah, what the settings for a particular step are. Um, yeah, we want a static page listing uh, of our workflows, so that could be part of Hub or could be something else. Um, I guess this is to be seen what we're going to do there. Um, we also recently ran into problems when uh, some of the steps would only work with like, I mean, we're kind of resource intensive, like I don't need a lot of CPUs, a lot of memory more than the uh, GitHub worker gives us. Um, I think it would be a pretty good use case to start using the global pulsar network. So then we register a user account for the AWC and submit uh, specific steps there. Um, and um, another option there would be AWS batch, but um, not everyone can get this. And ideally, the pattern we set up with the AWC can be followed by other communities. Uh, so if we could use pulsar, that would be amazing. Um, we want to produce our create invocations, um, import export. Part of that is already merged, and part of that um, is yet to be done. And we also want to publish that with each published workflow so that users can see the workflow itself, the README, the change log, and an example of what it looks like. Um, we need a schema for the job and test definitions. This is a little in the weeds, but when you start writing tests, 
Uh, it's not immediately obvious what options are available, and we may run the entire test that can take from a couple of minutes to a couple of hours just to see that you didn't use quite the right test syntax. So that is extremely frustrating. Um, yeah, and then interactions with other working groups, uh, UI UX for the workflow editor, um, expression editor, uh, backend for the workflow features, and the tool shed uh, serving the tool state. Um, BGP uh, for the workflows that they are currently working on. And um, I think there may or will be, I don't know, a merger with the tools working group, which um, seems to be doing project specific workflows anyway. So I think that would be a good fit. Um, <clears throat> just one note or question. Uh, the workflow group needs to prioritize um, announcement of new workflows. So I think if you're thinking about static page on Hub, then let's do this soon. And for example, all these new workflows, <coughs> the single cell stuff, is that all tweeted? Is, is I that... don't think we have single cell ones. That's regular transcriptomic. Uh, no, I, it's not, but well, we also just uh, merged uh, them now. So, okay. uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely the plan. Uh, tweet out, describe what they're doing, what they take as inputs, make so, it. And this is, so, you had this idea to do these Twitter like, so, so actually you can get all the information by just reading the tweet, which is the absolutely correct approach for this. So, we should start soon. Yeah. Um, I think we put this actually in our last uh, meeting document. Martin and I will will write some tweets, I think. Could you could you say a bit more about what it will be, look like to embed it into the hub? Is it sort of um, the uh, uh, I don't know graph visualization of the workflow, or is it is it more than that? Um, yeah, I mean, so if you go to the individual, so each one of these workflow gets a proper repository that has a readme change log. Um, yeah. So that's the first part that we can display. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward to just do like a cytoscape visualization of the workflow. Um, ideally, I'd really love to embed the workflow editor in there as a read-only preview component that, that lets people see the workflow as they would see it if they import it into Galaxy. But it will be tied to the GitHub repo so that if you wanted to, you know, have text and other images sort of available, that could be done there. Um, I think we're probably going to do uh, some scraping at first. So yeah. not use the like, GitHub page infrastructure, but instead um, do this via central CI job. Um, I mean, it, metaphorically, it, it smells a little bit like a Jupyter notebook, but for a whole workflow, right? Where you can have the code, you can have you know text describing it, you can have visualizations, and then the the big button, you know, go run on a thousand samples, <laughs> which is pretty. Yeah, exciting I mean, I, I guess. Um, yeah, if you if you look at the doc store interface, I mean, it's kind of like that, right? Um, yeah. But I think we need this also for just for Galaxy workflows. So I mean, yeah. my mental model is of this is still how NF Core does it. I don't know if you've seen this, uh, how they list their workflows. I, I I think this is pretty good if we can get there. Cool. I'll go check that out. And it's I mean it shouldn't be very hard. Um, we have the material. The hard part is. Uh, describing you know the readme and the change log and, and the inputs and the outputs and the considerations and what you need to take care of uh, and that's done so yeah i mean i totally agree with anton we need to publicize this great great thank you marius yep. next up is tools all right the tools working groups left is pretty Short. Mainly, we have primarily been continuously updating and supporting several projects. The VGP, for example, we've been working on some COVID projects as well, some independent tools. But to that end, most of our work has historically just been support for projects. 
And we're looking to really formalize that by merging with the IWC, um, where we will work on tools um, with the eye specifically of putting them towards large scale workflows that can be published like this. Uh, we will continue to to update tools as necessary, but having that ha having direct goals for every tool um, is something that I think we all would like. Um, this changes a little bit of how the IWC uh, working group might I maybe mean, it functions a little bit, mainly in that there could, there will be a little bit more of an assigning to people who are on the project of working on specific workflows rather than people working independently on a workflows and then a workflow structure in general. But we do want to talk that through with everybody involved and see how this is going to function, which is why I have not added a goals for, for GCC 2023 slide, because we still need to discuss that. So we're uh, I've put up a when to meet poll um, to hopefully meet at some point in the next week or so uh, to discuss this with as many people as possible and figure out how this is going to work in goals moving forward. Anyone is welcome to join. And what does IWC thinks about this? I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I think currently our meetings are um, mostly people heavily invested in the infrastructure side. So now we've built it. Um, if we can then also attract people authoring workflows uh, that would make a lot of sense and you know if there's some tools missing for those workflows to be awesome then it's great to have people that have capacity to do that this also like for example a large part of the uh, of the work on the vgp has been working towards these workflows and as marius and delphine have both separately um stated it is they have to go through one another for all of the issues for anything but this makes it a central place where people working on these projects have one place to talk about the workflows and the tools and things that are necessary rather than having to go back and forth between a tool, between a project, the tools group, and the IWC. Um, and also, we used to have the IWC meetings at the same time spot as the VGP meetings. So I think that was also a bit of an unfortunate disconnect. Yeah, I guess, you know, from my perspective, this seems like a positive change. And I, I think it's I think it's good that we're um, self-reflective on the orgs, you know, for the working groups and let it iterate and evolve, you know, as it makes sense. Thanks so much, Al. Um, I guess we'll either rename the tools update for our next progress meeting then. Great. Up next is GOATS. All right. So um, starting with the training part of the GOATS group, um, the Galaxy Mentoring Network is uh, starting slowly. We have three paired mentor mentees um, group. Uh, one has started the project. Uh, I think two are waiting for the first, I mean, they have been paired, they know each other, but uh, the project hasn't really started yet. Uh, we have nine applications in review. Uh, once we have reviewed people who are interested and have a, um, a project um, defined enough, uh, then we look for mentors for this uh, application. Uh, we are starting to organize the next Borges board, uh, which is gonna take place in spring. Um, we need volunteers as for every year. Especially since we're going to need new videos, since the new history has been released, uh, videos need to be updated. Uh, there's a lot of train the trainer event happening, uh, part of Gallantries. There's a training event happening in Springs. And there's a course builder in, in beta for people to organize the workshop and plan for um, the training. Uh, next slide, please. On the GTN side, we have new material, uh, including microbiome data analysis. We have a whole new topic, uh, data science, with 35 new tutorials, including Python, R, SQL, Bash, and SnakeMake. Uh, there's been a lot of updated update in the train trainer um, 
category in combination with Elixir Train Trainer. Uh, there's a choose your own adventure tutorial that has been implemented a while ago, but I don't know if we communicated about that. Um, and there's been a big work this past few months to improve the uh, accessibility of the uh, GTN website. Uh, the boxes are now replaced with uh, proper hierarchical headings, sorry. Uh, we're following the ARIA um, guidelines for accessibilities, and we have no support for the prefer reduced motion um, uh, function. Um, next slide. On the outreach uh, side, we have we haven't we have skipped the outreach intern program this cycle, and uh, we are wondering if we want to participate to next cycle. So we are welcoming people who have ideas on uh, what project we could um, find intern for. Uh, we're discussing taking part of the Google uh, Summer Google Code Summer event. Sorry, I'm missing a word there. Google Code Summer event. Uh, which would be in association with Gmod. We tried doing that previous year, but we couldn't contact them. I don't, I don't know, some miscommunication in the middle. Uh, we would need to contact, try to contact them again early, mid-January for uh, this 2023 Google Summer Code. Um, on the side of community management, we're looking for volunteers to be active on Twitter, people who are used to Twitter. Personally, I'm afraid of it, so I'm not a good Call for that, but if people are comfortable with it, uh, we're gonna try to get better on that. And we're also gonna uh, be more involved in the uh, release discussion to be able to uh, spread the task of communicating new release across the group and not just put that on Elena or Bia as it was um, previously. Uh, next slide. And um, finally, the, the last big uh, thing the, the group is involved in is the hub. So Nick is leaving soon. He has a new job. Um, we're not sure yet who's going to inherit the hub management. Uh, he's documenting everything before leaving. Uh, one task that is started but won't be able to complete before leaving is the migration of content from EU to org. Uh, so this is going to be in the project for the coming quarter, but we're not sure who's going to be in charge of that or how we're going to uh, deal with the hub management. Um, uh, I should say I'll be able to get most of it. The, the, um, the bulk will be some formatting left. That's it. And that's it for us. So this is, as always, the outreach is doing great. Uh, I have a question just about the course builder. This is first I hear of this. What can you say a few more words about what that is? Uh, can I share my screen? Thank you. So it's in beta right now, but. Um, Basically, it allows us to select uh, what is the topic, uh, how to organize schedule, um, configuring the event. Uh, I haven't used it, played a lot with it, but uh, yeah, it's it's allows you to to organize planning and 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 uh, link tutorials and having duration and. Okay. Okay. So so it's for like a workshop to help with the logistics, the registrations, and things like that. Okay. Thanks. So thanks for that, uh, Delphi. And that was, you know, there's, it's always so impressive, all the activities. I'm wondering if you have a sense of like, um, is there any sort of noticeable uptick or downtick in community, um, interactions with these materials you know the i think the the big events are like really well attended um what the smorgasbord was like thousands of people for example uh, but i guess i'm wondering about all the other events <laughs> and if you have a if you have a pulse on um uh you know 
how how people how people are engaged uh, right now? Um, well, there's a bit lot of engagement uh, contribution wise uh, for using the tutorial. I don't have number. Uh, I need to ask Elena. I think she has some uh, metrics on how often the pages are visited. Uh, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think we have some number I can forward them to you because there's usually uh, satisfaction polls after trainings that we mm -hmm. ask uh, to, to to return. Uh, I know that for GCC, the training, um, scientific training has been, has have had low attendance, but I think that's more because most of the attendees were more on the developer side than on the user side uh, compared to other uh, Galaxy conference previously. Uh, but I, I get this number for you. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Uh, again, I'm just trying to get a sense of, um, you know, are, are, we, are we still moving in the right direction or are there things that need to be adjusted? Well, considering the the, the uh, enthusiasm for train the trainer and, and the number of, of participation, I think that's used. I mean, um, Especially we've had demand for accessibility, uh, people finding problem using it. So it's definitely used enough to notice these problems. Yeah. <laughs> in, a, in a funny way, that's a good metric of success if people are- Yeah, I think so. I mean, if, if, we, if we're at the point where like some, but I mean, I've discussed with people giving training and, and they're pretty happy with it, uh, but then I'll give you more number, cold number, I mean, logical number for it. Great, thank you. In terms of tweeting, can we just create a, you know, like a metrics channel within Galaxy? So people who basically will dump things they want to tweet, and then somebody who has access to Twitter will just go, and there are, we have several people like that, will just go once a day and see what's there and just do it. This, I think, would spread this a little bit better. Well, Bjorn had a proposal for that automated system that you just like commit to a GitHub repo and it would take care of it. Uh, I don't, automated system, they're like dry. It's it's uh, it's like automated voice when you call United Airlines. I mean, it's not particularly um, helpful. I think there needs to be a twist. So like a human wrote this. And I think that's not that difficult if, uh, if we don't have to dig and find what to tweet if we actually have a list of things. So for example, Mario says new workflow, he just dumps there, okay, here's a new workflow, tweet about it. And then we do that. One of us do, does that. I have to say, I think it'd be um, whatever system we come up with for this would also be uh, useful for like uh, announcing stuff on the hub. Um, like having, we've talked about having some systems so you can just, anyone can just suggest a post for the hub and maybe you could check something that says like, or tweet this to whatever channel could be useful for that too, that's, that's what I'm saying. Aren't we making it more complicated than it is sending out a tweet? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it could just be a, a matrix channel. It's like, please tweet this. Also post it on the hub if you want, you can send out there. I don't know if we can queue Twitter as we can queue YouTube so the tweet are released regularly and and not wave by wave. I thought Dave had this set up at one point. Like there was a, uh, maybe it was in the third party thing he was using or something, but there was like a backlog of stuff that he would schedule to tweet out at particular times. And if yeah, we just we, kind of like that, can compose that, that library or something. Yeah, okay. Pia also oh, did this already. So it, it must still exist. I mean, she did that for the last release, I think. Well, this will only work if it's easy. So, I mean, if it's, if it's not easy, it's not going to work. <laughs> it is. It's very easy. I think also how um, Mike also mentioned it as as commits and beyond is fairly straightforward. So someone would make a commit to a branch, and then if it gets approved by others, it would maybe hopefully automatically uh, tweet it maybe also on different platforms. I like that idea. Well, Anton, I think what you were trying to do is separate the editorializing of the tweet with the content, right? Like you were saying, I want to tweet about this, but you want some someone else to come up with like the right words. So you need two cues, one that just gets the ideas to the editors and then another cue that actually 
publishes, right? Well, I was hoping I mean, that, I mean, we're, I think we're spending too much time on this, but the, the, the basic idea is that uh, if there is a blob, I mean, if, again, Marius or uh, somebody, so, so here's this workflow, it does this, and just, you know, if, as one sentence, and then I'll edit, for example, that sentence and put it on Twitter. That's, so, edit, so editorial is done by somebody else. I see. And um, Martin shared some a link for the uh, GTN metrics. Um, thank you, Martin, uh, with some numbers on the chat. Thank you. Much we'll move on to the next working group, which is systems. Hello. Okay, so um, we have made some progress with the total perspective vortex. This is essentially the um, dynamic rule, job scheduling rule that um, that uh, the. Uh, use Galaxy Australia developed um, in order to route a lot of their jobs to Pulsar um, across lots of lots of different Pulsars. They've been using it in production for I think a year plus now. Um, and so after the European Galaxy days, uh, we all worked together and uh, the European server is now using it for some tools and I'm using it on the US server for on, on test. Um, and and uh, I'm collecting runtime data about current um, tools so that we can make some priority decisions so that quick jobs run on uh, priority resources. So um, yeah, thanks to Nguyen, Catherine, and Simon uh, for all their help as we've been working on this. Um, with Pulsar and the global Pulsar network, so as I mentioned, Australia now runs a significant amount of their jobs through Pulsar. Um, and the same is, is true of the US. Currently, we do. And that number is only going to increase, especially as our latest uh, access allocation um, includes a whole bunch of different systems and a ton of service units on Jetstream, too, like we have a lot. So um, we want to make full use of those. Um, use Galaxy Spain is uh, now going to be running across. Uh, is going to launch and run across four different supercomputing centers in Spain uh, using Pulsar. And in the next year, 11 different um, compute centers in the EU are going to be using Pulsar. So it's become becoming a, uh, or is a very critical part of the Galaxy infrastructure. Um, and so uh, uh, one of the exciting things that's happened um, is there have, been some improvements uh, in the way that uh, co-execution works. Um, originally from Vipul, the uh, um, Summer of Code student, and then John took that and, and worked on it as well. But essentially, this means that uh, running um, uh, Galaxy uh, jobs via Pulsar uh, will continue to be much more independent of Galaxy itself. Um, and we can do some pretty exciting things that don't require like fixed uh, resources um, and like a monolithic Pulsar server that just runs uh, all the time. Uh, next slide. Uh, as far as the distributed computing goals go, um, so Bjorn, uh, and folks in Freiburg have been uh, collaborating with uh, people at CERN um, and discussing po possibly using Dirac, uh, um, which is a job meta scheduling system, um, to do some of the, uh, the, the global Pulsar network scheduling. Um, and then there's also this advanced resource connector, or ARC, part of Nordic Grid now. Um, which uh, also does some level of scheduling. I'm not clear on how these components integrate, but um, uh, Bjorn can talk more about that. The 
uh, distributed data stuff that has been worked on uh, successfully for the last couple of years is of increasing interest. So here on usegalaxy.org, um, so our test server runs all of its uh, all of its data is stored in irods at this well. All of its new data is stored in irods, um, and then on the main server, uh, we have a couple of users that use it. Um, and Kavan is still working out uh, issues as they come up um, with this deployment. But we want to start ramping that up a bit more. Uh, with our main goal being able to archive. Uh, users old data off to essentially tax giant uh, tape system. Um, use uh, use galaxy.be uh, in Belgium is also interested in IRODs uh, and um, the Italians and, and uh, EU folks in Freiburg are investigating S3 uh, as a backend. Uh, Simon did a bunch of work on the Intergalactic Data Commission at the COFEST after the conference this year. Uh, so the tooling is mostly in place to generate the data. Now we just have to get uh, the automation of, of running it and getting that stuff into CBMFS uh, uh, finished up. Next slide, please. Uh, so gravity. Um, don't think we talked about the last meeting uh, or update, but it's essentially a, a process management tool for, for Galaxy uh, that, that uh, Marius and I revived. Uh, it was originally written seven years ago or so, uh, but we, we got it uh, up and running for 2201 and uh, I've been doing a ton of work to overhaul it in the last few weeks. Um, now has systemd support, uh, which is a much nicer way to run a Galaxy server for uh, uh, production sites, and we'll have a 1.0 release coming out shortly. Um, part of this as well uh, is trying to figure out what to do with our zero downtime restarts. So this used to be handled by uh, UWSGI for us, but now that we've switched to GUnicorn, we don't have uh, that, that functionality anymore. And so when, uh, when I restart, use galaxy.org you can see some downtimes because there's some issues with unicorn herder um and we've we've tried to address those bjorn and i but uh, they have not been uh, looked at by the unicorn herder maintainers because essentially i think they've abandoned the project and there's some other drawbacks to this unicorn herder so um uh based on um, an idea from helena uh use galaxy.eu is now running um, multiple G Unicorn processes concurrently. Um, Mir, Mir and Bjorn got this working uh, last week, and the the way to to then do zero downtime restarts in the future will be just to restart those in like a round robin fashion. Um, and uh, we're working on uh, automating that in Gravity so that you don't have to do that restart process yourself. Um, for ITs, uh, so ITs were broken on usegalaxy.org for a long time because uh, tax Kubernetes cluster was broken for a long time, and it still is as far as I know. But uh, Alex uh, Mahmoud set up a, uh, a Kubernetes deployment on Jetstream 2 using our Jetstream 2 allocation, uh, but he set it up for us, and it is all, it, that's where we're currently running our um, ITs, and it's working. Um, and uh, EU and, and as well as uh, usegalaxy.org have made some improvements in the way that we run ITs because of tail scale, which I don't have uh, a ton of time to go into right now, but essentially uh, I can, we've created a, a like a VPN, um, which is like trivially easy to create a VPN between the Kubernetes cluster running in Jetstream 2 and uh, the job handlers at TAC. And because of this, we removed an entire layer of complexity of the uh, IT proxy that you have to, like we had this system where you could forward requests from one side to the other, and you don't have to do that anymore because of this magic with, with tail scale. Um, enables us to do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, 
a lot of work has gone into in the past few releases uh, moving asynchronous or long running tasks to asynchronous salary tasks. And um, the production servers that use galaxy.star had not really been using this much. Um, but as of last week, use galaxy EU is. Um, actually, I updated this slide while it was loaded. So I uh, can't remember what I wrote. Oh, uh, Australia has um, uh, deployed it on their dev server. And then uh, we're not, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, we're not running it yet in the US, but we will. Uh, Mira developed a uh, role to install Flower, which gives you this nice little monitoring dashboard and, and some management as well. Um, and so this is all uh, starting to look great. So there's a lot of talk among uh, the deployers, the, the use galaxy.star folks about how we're going to run Celery, how we're going to you know limit it, how what to do with this. And I'm not sure that we've uh, come to concrete answers yet, but for now we're trying to set up at least a separate machine, separate VM where these things run um, and, and we'll go from there. All right, uh, next slide, please. So as far as the future goes, uh, we need to finish deploying TPV. Um, I'm working on this, uh, as I said, I'm collecting statistics about runtimes. Um, uh, we need to enable the, the full Celery deployment on Australia and the US. Uh, I probably need a new VM for this, but um, I need to do some VM upgrades anyway, so uh, we'll get around to that. Uh, currently, use galaxy.star. None of the servers use the extended metadata uh, stuff, especially with Pulsar. And, that, and the reason for that is that you have to have a, a clone of Galaxy that you keep up to date on all of your Pulsar endpoints, which is a huge pain in the butt. Um, and so really before we're gonna deploy this in production, I think we need to just uh, have, uh, be able to use packages, Galaxy packages ra rather than uh, having to clone it. But um, we're actually most of the way there and the, the components to configure this in Galaxy are there. You can set the metadata command and stuff. So uh, we just need to like document how to do it and, and try it out. Uh, the Intergalactic Data Commission, we really are going to uh, get this working in the next, um, hopefully next cycle, but before the GCC, because uh, it's desperately needed. Um, need to update the admin training for, for the new uh, architecture, the uh, Genocorn stuff. Um, I'm going to do more with, with WireGuard and TailScale, uh, and then um, try to alleviate and do less uh, workarounds to the limitations in, in Galaxy uh, by pushing more of our problems, I guess, up to the backend group. Um, and one nice thing that I think we really need to get going here is, a, uh, is point releases. Um, all the tooling is there to create, you know, so essentially like 2205.1.2.3 it's just nobody ever makes the decision to say we're going to have the next point release right uh so we need to do that um more tools we'll use containers and uh, we're going to figure out this meta scheduling problem for pan galactic jobs uh, whether we can just use tpv for this or we need some additional layer in between and uh, we'll have pip install galaxy and that's it for us. Are we ready or are we going at some point to advertise Pulsar as a solution not only for Galaxy? Uh, maybe John can talk more about that. It is very, it, it was intended not to be very Galaxy specific, but it is very Galaxy specific. But also, you know, there's work being done to, you know, be able to run more general, you know, test jobs and that kind of stuff through it. Um, so I, I don't know. There's a lot of work in this space, and I don't know if it benefits us to, to do this with Pulsar or, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. John, do you want to say anything about that? I mean, yeah, my... My intuition says no, right? Like it's, uh, 
like you said, there's just, there's so much stuff in the space and they're starting without the uh, baggage of Galaxy, right? So if you want to just schedule containers or just run jobs and you don't care about all of Galaxy's internals and specifics, you can write a lot cleaner code. Um, and so I, I just, I don't know why we'd want to compete with, you know, other test implementations or, you know, whatever. Yeah, as Mary yeah, says, the, the code execution, oh God, you're gonna say. <laughs> I, I think we've been moving in that direction anyway to have Pulsar also serve a bit more as like the glue stuff that can translate Galaxy's specifics into stuff that can be used with other container scheduling technologies, right? So I, I does that make sense? <laughs> So I was a little confused about one point. So I think you said something like 70% of um, AU's jobs run Pulsar and there's a lot of activity uh, in the US and in Spain and so forth. And then you mentioned that there was ongoing work for distributed computing, but it wasn't clear to me, like, is that in development? Is that uh, running in a limited capacity? Is that running in production? Uh, I just was confused about that status. It is, uh, we're very much running. So each individual galaxy has an, a network of Pulsar servers that um, that it is using fully in production at this point. But the, there's a sort of a bigger project using to expose the global Pulsar network to more, uh, more people, more galaxies. And um, we don't currently know how we're going to, you know, schedule things on a higher level, right? I see. So it's at kind of the design phase of like, um, there's agreement that, that this would be a good thing and you're kind of working through the technical design of like how this should be implemented. Yeah. It, seem, it seems complicated when you start thinking about, you know, user identity, uh, data management, compute management. I agree it's a good thing, but it, it sounds complicated. Yeah, yeah. That's why we're looking at some of these other projects like Dirac and Arc because they already handle that, you know, sort of um, identity stuff. Yeah, they had a whole week long, well, multi day long hackathon to just work through user ID management and yeah, <laughs> they're in a different space. Uh, but I think we can yep. use what they're doing. I will say there's like momentum around some of the GA4 GH standards, um, like RAS passports. Um, you know, so you know, whenever we can beg, borrow, and steal standards from other people, I think that will make our lives easier. For sure, yeah. We we don't want to implement things ourselves. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. And last right. but not least, it is backend. So now we're at the working group that implements everything for themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the uh, we've divided it into sort of goals for 23.1, 23.2. SQL um, Alchemy 2.0 is going to happen. And the earlier we can move there, the better it is, because uh, I think for us, the immediate big benefit is everything coming from the database is completely typed. Um, but in order to get there, uh, we'll have to adjust some of our patterns and make everything work. But John Davis has been on top of it. So he's uh, positive we can do it soon after 2.0 is out. So beta one was just released I think two or three days ago. Um, so we'll, we'll see where we are. Um, then something that comes up a lot is the somewhat unbounded growth of uh, the Galaxy database and that we may have to remove some items directly from the database or so either drop some parts or some content from tables or drop columns um, and other optimizations like uh, indexes and so on. Uh, so he's going to focus on that for 23.1. Um, we want to have the invocation export import really solid. Uh, we already have history export, but 
uh, we want to wrap this up in and with our crates, which is a little bit more structured than our somewhat well pre proprietary format that that we have. Um, we want to produce log and archived histories. Um, Pulsar container scheduling. Uh, so John already did a lot of work on this, um, taking uh, the uh, well PR test approach that was a Galaxy job runner and made this into a Pulsar job runner. Um, and I think there is a little bit of this miscommunication that. Pulsar always needs to have its own server. That's not the case. Pulsar also has a lot of the glue code um, to adapt sort of the Galaxy patterns into something that can be used with container scheduling technologies. Uh, so that's a very exciting uh, direction. And then we'll also make sure that extended metadata works properly in Pulsar and also uh, that it's easier to install. Um, yeah, something that came up in collaboration with the workflows group is workflow conditionals. I think we really need them. We should also have step input expressions. Uh, it's somewhat similar problems to solve, which is um, JavaScript expressions, uh, being able to write them in a guided and validatable way so that we don't throw users under the bus. Um, it's a power user feature, but I think we really do need it. Um, yeah, we want to enable updating DocStore and Workflow Hub workflows from the user interface. Um, there are some um, some details that need to be worked through with what we do with metadata um, and how we organize our database models for that. Um, we want to also be able to support uh, modifying the sub workflow in the parent context. So when you're editing a workflow um that you can jump right into the sub workflow as well and, and and change things there um when a workflow invocation fails to schedule you just know that it failed um that's not great uh we need to do a lot better there um so um mm, yes um, that, that's not great. We, we need to improve that. Um, we also want to make the step job progress uh, more transparent. So um, when you look at the progress of a workflow invocation, uh, this is currently split into you know how many of the steps have been scheduled, and then the, each step may have a number of jobs associated to it. Uh, so um, we want to make that easier to to see from the workflow invocation page but then also when you click on an invocation that you see immediately okay how far along are the steps so this is uh something that isn't terribly hard to do but we need to find efficient queries to do that um yeah then i already mentioned we want to support graph-based views of invocations for 23.1 um so again this is a little simpler than uh, doing this right for the history because we already know the structure that's defined by the workflow, the inputs and outputs. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can work out the data structure and hopefully learn something about how we want to do this for our histories as a next step. And then we want to also do the final push for GX Format 2 as the primary uh, workflow format that users get when they download uh, workflows from Galaxy because they are much more uh, hand writable, readable, uh, and I think we can build much better tooling around this. Um, but again, there are some some details to walk through. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then for twenty three point two, so John's already busy with this, but um, yeah, I mean, there's it's a partial rewrite of the toolshed, uh, essentially ripping out uh, old parts that we don't need or that we shouldn't be needing. Um, and then in return, adding things like serving the tool state so that um, when you work with the workflow outside of Galaxy, you could just get information about the tool from that particular tool shed API. Um, this, this will be very powerful, I think. Um, yeah, so um, in 23.1, I already mentioned conditionals and step input expressions. Uh, we'll start with just having them available in the API and um, 
in uh, web cross imported from GX Format 2. Uh, but no sort of user facing um, option to do this, uh, which we would add then in 23.2, because again, as I mentioned, we don't want to throw users under the bus. Uh, there should be guidance. You will have a job object object that you can explore uh, visually I mean, or with, with auto completion and something that will tell you this thing doesn't actually exist. So your expression is going to fail. Um, we want to modernize the tool state. This is a topic on its own. Um, it's both removing a lot of legacy things that hold back Galaxy and that will hold some. Um, it's a little abstract, but that will bring a lot of improvements uh, down the road. Will make it much easier to reason about um, parameters in all sorts of different uh, contexts. But uh, for instance, it will be critical to produce accurate uh, workflow extraction. I mean, it, we have this currently. You can extract a workflow from the history, but it's not quite as precise as it should be. Um, this will help a lot there, but there's many other reasons um, why we need to modernize the tool stage or more to an entire document on this. Um, we want to enable in the user interface for users to select the object store where new data sets are to be created or where data sets within a history should go. Um, so that could be scratch storage, permanent storage, slow fast, um, other things. Um, we want to uh, restructure part of the API and, and how we are serializing it so that we can um, ship off to the client the models that the API is going to produce so that when you start working on something, you can auto-complete to see the attributes that will be available. You will also know which ones are optional, so you can take proper precaution uh, and know that your code will work in all situations and not just the one you tested. And at the same time, it gives us strong guarantees that when we change the API, we're not breaking the user interface. Um, yeah. um, there's a lot of things we want to make uh, async, so take it out of the web request cycle. That can take a long time. So this would, for instance, be tool submission if you are mapping over a giant collection. Um, Galaxy will, in the back, sort of prepare parts of uh, the, the job itself, create the outputs before returning. Um, we want to make that instant and instead track the progress um, asynchronously that is going to happen in salary in the back. Um, other uh, valuable targets there are history copies or imports that can take a while. Um, yeah, um, these were instructions for me to prepare this uh, slides. So. Oops. Um, yes, um, I already mentioned this. Um, yeah. And then in 23.2, it um, work on the data for the graph-based uh, history. Um, yeah, and the interactions with other working groups, uh, UI UX, um, that's for the invocation history graph view. We'll be working um, together there uh, with the workforce working group for workflow features and tool shed state and uh, systems for deployment of uh, salary, gravity, fast API, unicorn, um, all these things. You have an incredible amount of bullet points here. I mean, is it really feasible? Um, yes, I'm going to say it's um, it's feasible. Uh, it's also ambitious. The thing is, all of this needs to be done. <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't think there's anything on here where we can say, well, let's just post that off to next year. Um, so, I mean, it, it's ambitious. I think some of it will probably need to push over, but, you know, we need to put on also things that take more than a year to do and work on them in smaller pieces. Could you say a little bit more about how you see uh, the RO create fitting in versus, I don't know, the GA format or publish histories? It seemed like they have somewhat overlapping goals. 
Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm the, uh, the best person to do this. Um, so what we're doing, uh, we have a plugin system where you can put in your different uh, formats and flavors of the hour. Uh, it seems that our crate is checking a lot of the boxes uh, in terms of um, metadata structure. Um, you can have different profiles, so there's going to be a Wipro run profile. Um, and I think uh, it's something that's uh, catching on um, also as format uh, being used in other external hosting sites. So I think the big advantage I see there personally is that uh, we can get contents of the Arrowcrate without downloading the entire thing. And so could provide, for instance, previews of an archived history. And then you don't need to first import it to know what, in, what is in it, which is currently the case with how mm -hmm. we export uh, histories and workflows. And it's nice to work with standards, basically the thing. Now, which standard that is, I mean, sounds a bit harsh, but I don't care. <laughs> but you do see uh, there is a community uh, around it, and there's tooling, and there's support for it. Yeah, I mean, I think we have good links with uh, the people that are working on uh, our crate itself. Um, so I think this makes a lot of sense for us. But I mean, at the same time, like we also support biocompute, for instance, but that's uh, somewhat different. They don't, I mean, th there's not really the ar um, artifacts attached to it. Um, so it's it's more of a metadata description as far as I understand it. Got it. Thanks for clarifying. I mean, I think my addition there would be, I mean, I think maybe people oversell our old crate in, in our maybe implementation of it, but I mean, it would be nice to see some tooling and when that tooling is available, it'd be nice to Galaxy could talk into that. And I, I think ultimately, uh, like Marius's comment that like, I don't care is kind of, part of that is it's pretty easy, right? Like we've got all of our core stuff packed into the RO crate, right? So we're, we're doing some stuff to annotate some additional metadata, but we're still ultimately sort of importing the history the way we, we do it. So it's not, it's not adding a ton of code, but it's, it's making things, I mean, it just feels like good PR. Um, honestly, I mean, it, it uh, makes yeah. other projects happy. And I think that's, that's always a good thing to do. And it's, in that, it's in that not, sense, it's I care. Huge, <laughs> yeah. It's not a huge amount of work is what I'm saying to support all of these, like the infrastructure to support asynchronous workflow exports took 10 times the amount of effort as like, let's add a new format that we're going to export, you know, writing the dashboard, David writing the dashboard, um, and, and, and building that UI story is so much more work than just sort of you know, adding another checkbox of what kind of format we're going to export. So it's it's good PR. It's low hanging fruit, I think. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this is a specific comment just towards back end group, um, but to all the groups. Obviously, you know, I, I think every group is has has presented a lot of great plans and. Some of them are, are quite ambitious, I, I think, across the board. Is there a, an overall plan on how to sort of work well to find out sort of the not necessarily easier projects, but maybe somewhat easier but shorter length projects to sort of help onboard people that are not necessarily as familiar with the, the underpinnings? I mean, we're looking at the back end. So obviously, Galaxy itself as a framework is quite complex um, if you've never worked with it before. Um, and so, you know, what, what are, are there any any sort of steps for how to get people to actually who have not been, you know, here for five years or longer or whatever to get involved with some of these these sort of uh, smaller projects? I mean, the, it's not that hard to get into it, right? Um, so for instance, okay, let, we don't have a list of issues that are ready to be taken um, because I mean, having that issue is like, okay, somebody's gonna do that, right? Um, I would say that the working groups 
are a great environment to get started uh, and to guide you. I mean, we can pick something that, that fits you. So most of the time, external contributors coming in have a very specific thing they want to do. So, you know, that's uh, that's the thing. And we may or may not be able to help them there based on how feasible that is. Um, other than that, like a new developer coming in, I mean, yeah, I mean, do with some API routes. I mean, port them to fast API. This is fantastic learning uh, material. And I think our recent people that joined the team that are doing backend work have done this in a fabulous way. Um, I think that's that's an easy win. So yeah, modernizing some of the API routes, you, you read the old code, you see where we want to go. Um, similarly, implementing salary tasks are also relatively straightforward at this point. Um, but I mean, oh, I wouldn't really say it makes a lot of sense to have 10 good first issues because well, we want to do them anyway. That's the same problem we had with the paper cuts. Sure, yeah, absolutely. As soon as you define what it is, you might as well have just fixed it, yeah. I, think, I mean, I think... we had the, I mean, so like if there's somebody um, wanting to do a project, uh, we can come up with a project. In a sense, that's how the notification um, framework started. And like if somebody came up now and said, I would, you know, want to get started with Galaxy development, I'd say, great, the notification framework, I mean, it's almost there. It needs a push. Um, it'll involve both back and front end. Um, that's the thing to do. I think also uh, this is a, a tangent answer, but also with regard to onboarding new developers, at least comparing to the time when I came in, I think things things have gotten significantly better and it's significantly easier for someone completely new to the Galaxy code base to start being uh, productive, uh, specifically because of training. Uh, we have uh, the developer section in GTN is significantly different from what it was three or four years ago. Uh, Galaxy code architecture slides, they have grown probably twice in size, if I'm not mistaken, and that's a qualitative improvement. So it's not that there are there is more stuff, it's just that it's more like the slides have become more in-depth and comprehensible by someone who is new. In addition to that, we have uh, detailed tutorials targeted at new developers, how to write tests, how to debug Galaxy, especially how to add a new feature to Galaxy, which is a tutorial which uh, John wrote. Uh, it encompasses the whole process from start to finish with samples. We, we probably can improve that tutorial by adding more explanation or, or about why things are like that. But in general, I think today, someone coming in new to this code base, they have a roadmap for themselves to be productive much, much sooner. I mean, also, I would say that the developer tools available now are really, really good, right? So you can open Gitpod and you have a working live debugger, uh, both for the front and the back end. Um, yes, we have, right uh, tools we have for you. Sorry? Yes, yeah, no, no. tools for you. Yeah. <laughs> and workflows in 23.2. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, I mean, I think Gitpod is, is a huge improvement there. And um, we've integrated all these cool tooling things like uh, MyPy, Black, Prettier, uh, that also make it, you know, all these boring things you had to take care of. I mean, this this is all pretty much automated at this point. We have, we have a pre-commit thing like you you know, it still happens, but it's actually quite easy to to open PRs these days and not stumble through any of the obvious things like linting or types problems or things like that. Did you have um, Did you have new people in mind, Dan? Or no, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering. wondering you know, I, I just yeah. just in general, right? I, okay. I, 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 so um, the other thing um, is that each of these each of these tasks are very large tasks and are not going to be done in single PRs. So a lot of the time people will join a working group and they will tag along with a senior dev who will say, hey, I'm working on this. Here's a part of that you can help out with, which is a very different experience than jumping into a working group and one of the devs going, here's a problem we've got, here's some documentation, go. Because it's a specific problem with a specific 
uh, person that, that can be spoken to, uh, a specific point person, and it makes it a whole lot more personable than jumping into our famously large code base. Maybe this is where I'm, the um, the initiative to uh, the I'm, I'm blanking on the name, uh, but we talked about it in the outreach section, and I'm actually a mentor for it. But the, the, uh, the mentor network. Um, this is where that kind of thing comes in, right? You pair someone up with a someone that already has a project that can piece parts of it off. And I mean, I think, I mean, we, we did the Audrey project. Uh, I don't know that I would immediately do another one um, just for the fact that you don't know how much time somebody's going to spend on something. Whereas, you know, if, if it's an employee, I don't, I mean, we should definitely pair them up with somebody and, and get them to work on things. Uh, you know, maybe do some uh, pair programming, um, that sort of thing that I don't think we've done systematically in the past, but that we should definitely be doing, um, improving the onboarding procedure for, for new hires. Yeah, one thing on, on this topic that I, I thought I had after the GCC is that, um, a lot of the people who are presenting the developer materials are people who have been on the project for half a decade or more. And so they're not, they're not going to have the best insight about what a new developer needs. So it'd be nice if more of those materials could be presented by um, more junior developers, but you know, who have some experience on the project. And then the people who like the, the newest hires, uh, for the most part, I think didn't show up to the developer trainings, um, which is um, totally fine. I mean, there's so many good trainings and it's very useful to see what Galaxy looks like on the front end and how to deploy it. So there's like, I'm not saying like, it's necessarily the, the most useful training for them, but it, 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 it would be, it would be good if, if, you know, more people were contributing to the developer materials at sort of that that sort of mid galaxy point and then more new new people were attending the seminar or you know attending the trainings i think both of those things would sort of help improve those materials that john had mentioned um so we had this past gcc a talk from three of the new people at hopkins the new uh, new developers who gave a a presentation on what it's like at this point to start with Galaxy. That could also just be like a standing thing of the new people coming in um, each year, give a presentation of this is my experience getting started as a dev with Galaxy because it gives us all the perspective that we don't necessarily have. But was maybe that shouldn't be a GCC talk. Maybe that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. GCC or whatever, but some sort of a, a, a community presentation, community talk. some, sort, some yeah. sort of standing every year we get the new devs together, the, the new yeah. onboard people together, and they can say, this is my experience in the past several months. And I think all these are great ideas, but I, I'm even more more pleased that you guys think that uh, every everything's in line, that it's relatively straightforward to get involved. So. I mean, if you think it's all scalable, right? I mean, Galaxy itself, but also, you know, learning how to to work and, and code for Galaxy across the board. That's great. Thank and there's you. always question marks around. Yeah, well, of course. Things, yeah, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? But yeah. But you see new people coming in and be super productive. Um, we must be something, must be doing something all right. right? Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. No. That's you not, guys are doing a lot. You can't improve Everyone's it, but something really works. Great. A lot of, a lot of it, it may just be the hiring process, but. <laughs> <laughs> Bjorn actually has his hand raised. But he's muted in case he's speaking. I, I just wanted to pitch um, the Galaxy Mentoring Network. So we, we're still trying to get that up. Um, so if you're interested both as mentee and mentor, I mean, we, we are trying, right? So. Bjorn has posted the URL into the chat. Are there any other comments or questions? I just want to thank all the working group leads for um, 
organizing and reading any groups uh, for putting together these presentations. They're always really um, great to hear your accomplishments and uh, exciting to hear the future plans. Um, so thanks so much, everybody. And uh, we'll be scheduling out the next year of uh, working group progress meetings. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Also, thanks to Natalie for herding the cats here. Absolutely, absolutely. Without Natalie, this you know this will not happen. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks all. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.